Oh, sorry. I'm just taking inventory here. Joseph, you know, he had to manage all that food, make sure there was enough. I think we got enough ketchup. Yeah, but we'll need to get some more stuff. He had to collect a lot of stuff to feed all those Egyptians and the other people for those seven years when there was no food. We're going to be talking about Joseph. Interesting guy. We'll hear his story today. Our call to worship is printed. We invite you to follow along either on the screen or with the sheets that you were sent. God makes the sun rise and set. God is faithful from generation to generation. God makes summer and winter come and go. God is faithful from generation to generation. God helps plants grow and flowers bloom. God is faithful from generation to generation. God gives us food to eat, places to live, and people to love us. God is faithful from generation to generation. God is always with us. God is faithful from generation to generation. God keeps his promises to us. God is faithful from generation to generation. Let us praise our faithful God. Let us pray. God of all good things, we thank you that you are faithful to us. That you bless us with abundance beyond our imagining. We thank you that we do have food to eat, places to live, and people who love us. We thank you for these signs of your love and grace for us. We thank you that even when it seems that there may not be enough, you find ways to provide. For you own the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth of every mine, and you share it with all of human beings. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer of confession is also printed, either on the screen or on the sheets you were sent. Let's pray together. Loving God, we confess that sometimes we think we can do things by ourselves, and sometimes we are worried about things. We forget that you give us everything we have, and you make us who we are. Please forgive us for thinking about ourselves first. Please forgive us for not trusting you to take care of us. Thank you that you're for always loving us, even when we forget that we need you. In Jesus' name, amen.
I want to tell you a story that Jesus told. The story went like this. He said there was a king, and lots of people owed money to the king because the king was very wealthy. It turned out that one of the people who owed the king money owed him $20 million. I realize that that's bigger than any of us can imagine, but it's a lot of money. And so the king called in the person who owed the $20 million and said to him, you owe me $20 million, pay it back now. There's no way the person could pay back the $20 million immediately. So the man said, please give me some more time. If you give me some more time, I'll figure out a way to pay you back the $20 million. King almost laughed because more time? More time to pay back $20 million? But, anyways, the man kept pleading and begging. And finally, the king said to the man, I forgive you the entire debt. Gone. Don't have to pay it back. So the man left. Now, a little later on, so people came to the king again and said to the king, we need to tell you a story. That person you just forgave, he went out and he found someone who owed him 20 bucks, 20 dollars. And he grabbed that person, he shook him and he said, pay me my 20 dollars right now. The man said, well, I just need to go to the bank and I'll get it for you. No, right now, pay me my 20 dollars. If you don't, I'll have you arrested. Did. But his came took him away. He couldn't pay back the $20. So they said to the king, You forgave that man $20 million and he can't forgive $20. Jesus said, The king called the man back. He said, If you can't forgive other people, why should I forgive you? God's forgiven us in Jesus Christ. Sometimes forgiving other people is hard. In the story we're going to talk about Joseph, we're going to hear that he ticked his brothers off. He made them quite angry. And they couldn't forgive him. And some really bad things happened. We need to learn to forgive. Just like Jesus has forgiven us, we're invited to forgive. It's the same forgiveness that God has for us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, offers us forgiveness. Sometimes it's hard to forgive other people especially our brothers and sisters. Help us be people who forgive. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading today comes from the book of Genesis, commencing in chapter 37. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 11 and then continuing with verses 17 through 25. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. But first, let us turn to the Lord in prayer with the prayer of illumination. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book you have gifted us, this inspired word of God, this map of life. We ask you now for discernment that we may perceive the path you are directing each one of us to at this particular moment in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. 
Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now continuing with verses 17 through 25. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and, and throw him into one of these cisterns and and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. We're in the loft at St. Andrew's Church in Fergus. For many of you, you know that this is the youth room. And we're here because we're going to be talking about Joseph. Joseph was 17 when we meet him, and so this made a good place to think about Joseph. Let's be honest. The Joseph that we meet and we heard about was a bit of a jerk. There's no two ways about it. He was a tattletale. When his brothers didn't behave well in taking care of the sheep, he told his father on them. He was the favorite of his father, who made him a special coat. 
The Hebrew is a bit hard to translate. It was ornate, it had long sleeves, it was a coat of many colors. It doesn't really matter, it was special. And the other brothers didn't have it. It was a sign that he was Jacob's favorite. And then he had dreams. Dreams in which he was going to rule over them. He was going to be more important than his brothers. The one where the sheaf stood up that he had made and the other 11 sheaves bowed down to him. Or the one where the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to his star, to him, because he was the greatest. Joseph at 17 was not aware, not self-conscious, about how those stories, about how his actions were seen by others. He was a typical 17-year-old. He was a disruptor. We say so easily that children are a blessing from God. And when they're infants, yeah, they're pretty cute. Even when they're in grades one or two, they're pretty cute. But by the time they become teenagers, they're not so cute anymore. They become rather disruptive, changing, pushing, prodding. And the question that this story asks us is what do we do with the disruptors in our lives? Yes, I know that Joseph is sent by God and that God is going to use Joseph for a grand purpose. And so we have the benefit of looking back at Joseph's story and saying, wow, wasn't God great in using Joseph in that way? His brothers didn't have that benefit. All they had was this 17-year-old who kept reminding them that he was better than they were. And things happened. Again, what do we do with those disruptors in our families? Those who push and prod and demand and force us to change. What do we do with the disruptors, the teens, the twenties who come to the church and challenge us to do things in different ways, to think differently, to be different? What do we do with the teens and twenties in our communities who invite us to act differently, be different, think differently, and who have no problem telling us when we have stepped out of line in ways that only teens and twenties can do? What do we do? How do we act? Are we people who act as mentors to these people, these disruptors, do we come alongside and support and encourage to find ways to help them express what they are thinking and feeling in ways that will be heard? To help them be somewhat self-aware when they speak? Do we come alongside and encourage them to dream their dreams? Or do we shut them down? Shut them out? Joseph his brothers, Joseph's brothers, shut them down, lock them out. They have an opportunity to kill him, but in the end they decide not to because of Reuben's intervention. But then Judah has the great idea to make some money off of Joseph and sells, they sell him. They sell him as a slave and is taken off to Egypt. And now they have a problem. How are they going to cover up his disappearance? How are they going to explain to their father that he's not coming back? And so they tell a series of lies, both with their actions and by their non-words. And Jacob is heartbroken. And they can't tell the story. They can't tell without acknowledging their own culpability in what's happened. And they pay an enormous price for silencing the disruptor. I think one can argue 
that the price they pay for silencing the disruptor is greater than any disruption he might have been in their lives. And how often it might that be true in our own world. That the cost we pay for silencing disruptors, just turning them off, is far greater than the price it would be to listen, to engage, to reflect. There's one more thing about Joseph's age we need to note. To jump ahead in the story, for those of you who know, I'll give this very quickly, he is sold as a slave, ends up in prison, from prison, falsely accused, ends up in prison. From prison, he ends up miraculously becoming the prime minister of Egypt at the age of 30. Second in command. Responsible for the first, as, we far, as far as we know, the first significant famine relief program ever in the world at the age of 30. People much older than him were told by him what to do. Experience he'd experienced all of his life. One of the mentors in my life, Ian Rennie, would be saying, yeah, tell them about those under the age of 30 that God has used. It's one of Ian's favorite lines to remind us of the young people, the under 30s that God has used to disrupt the church for good. I'll just pull out a few. I have six that I want to introduce you to, some of whom you will know. So we'll start at the old end of 30. Billy Graham was 28 when he had his first campaign, his first crusade, and that was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He was 28. Mary Slessor was a missionary, Presbyterian missionary from Scotland to Nigeria. Calabar at the time, and she had an enormous impact on the indigenous community that she reached there. John Calvin was 27 when he wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion, a formative theological document that people through time since Calvin have engaged with as they've reflected on what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amy Carmichael ended up going to India when she was 27, but at the age of 19 in Ireland, she was preaching the good news to a group of people who worked in the mills, women who worked in the mills, and 500 people at a time would come and hear her proclaim the good news when she was 19 years old. Hudson Taylor was 21 when he ends up in China and changes the way in which missions was done in China, disrupting things profoundly. And Esther John, born as Kumar Zia, was converted to Christianity from Islam when she was 17 years old. At 27, she became an evangelist in Pakistan, her native country. At the age of 30, she was martyred. Her statue is among the 20th century martyrs, the statues that are at Westminster Abbey, marking the 20th century martyrs. And I could go on, but six names of individuals who disrupted things for God's kingdom. We are invited to be open to the disruptors, the 17-year-olds, the 21-year-olds, the under-30s, who challenge, push, prod, sometimes frustrating us, but inviting us to deeper things that God has for us. Will we mentor them, support them, let them dream dreams. Let them disrupt us. The church will be better off if we do. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our second scripture lesson today comes from, again, the book of Genesis. This time we'll be reading chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please, forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. The Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says that preaching Joseph's story is very difficult, hard to get right. He goes on to explain what he means. On one hand, it would be very easy to tell Joseph's story Yeah, some bad things happened to Joseph, but God had his back all the way through, and so it really wasn't that bad for Joseph. Things worked out pretty good in the end, and so just trust God, everything will be great. It's one way to tell the story. The other way to tell the story, because God doesn't show up that often in the story itself, is this way. Joseph was really gifted, extraordinarily winsome in his style, very charismatic, and through sheer ability, he rises to the position that he has by sheer human ingenuity. It's a fine balance. And Brueggemann reminds us that there are dangers with both of those approaches. The danger with the first one is that people say, that's not the way it is at all. Not everything works out so easily. Bad things really do happen that are really bad. And the answers don't seem to come very quickly, if at all. So that narrative about it just all works out fine in the end isn't the way my life works. And so it sounds superficial. The danger with the second approach, Brueggemann reminds us, is we might actually start to think that's the way it is. That it is about human ingenuity. That God really isn't playing a role. We forget about God entirely because his presence is so subtle in this story. And so we need to actually look at this passage we read from Genesis chapter 50. Some background is helpful. Jacob has died. The referee is gone. 
And so Jacob's, so Jacob's sons, other than Joseph, so Joseph's brothers, are now worried that Joseph, without the referee around, is going to really punish them for what they had done to him. That was just a bunch of talk a couple of chapters earlier. Now he's going to get them. And so they come to Joseph. And they say to Joseph, please, please, please forgive us for what we did. And Joseph breaks down and says this incredible line. What you did to me, you intended for harm, to hurt me. But God intended it for good. And see what has happened. People have been fed. People who have had no food have been cared for. We need to hear clearly what Joseph is saying here. His brothers wanted to harm him. Bad was being done. And really bad things happened to Joseph. He was sold as a slave. He was falsely accused of sexual abuse. Was thrown into prison. Not a Canadian prison in 2020. An ancient world prison. More horrible than we can imagine. And only after at least 10, at least 12 years, does do things turn out well and he become the prime minister of Egypt. 12 years of really, really difficult life as a slave and as a prisoner. His brothers wanted to hurt him, and they did. Joseph's not bitter about that, but Joseph wants us to understand, his brothers to understand, that wrong was done. And out of that wrong, God put Joseph to be in the right place to become the Prime Minister of Egypt, to launch the first, as far as we know, as I said earlier, as far as we know, famine relief campaign to feed the hungry in the wake of a famine. Could God have done it some other way? Absolutely. Did the harm need to happen? No, it didn't. But God redeemed it. Redeemed the harm, redeemed the brokenness, redeemed. And now some of you are probably jumping immediately to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8.28, which says, All things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose. A great verse. But the challenge with that verse is that sometimes, often I think in fact, it's quoted too glibly and without a sense of the context around it in Romans 8. Shortly before that passage, that verse, Romans 8, 28, we are reminded that all of creation groans. All of creation is in agony. All of creation is broken and hurting. All of creation. And wrong and harm and hurt happen in our world. We cannot deny that for one moment. God is in the business of redeeming, of transforming, of taking the good, the bad, the ugly, and the broken, and the hurting, and he will eventually redeem all things, transform all things, to be the place that this world is supposed to be. As Christians, we can own that there is wrong that has been done. Wrong has caused real harm. Wrong that has affected people profoundly. Because we know that redemption someday will be seen. Sometimes we're lucky as Joseph was. It's only 12 years. And we get to see the results of the redemption. 
Sometimes we'll only see a little piece of the redemption, not the whole thing. Sometimes all we will be able to do is wait until the end when redemption will fully be seen, the transformation will fully take place. Some of us in our lifetimes will not see the redemption of the hurt and the brokenness that we have experienced. But we know that redemption is coming. We know that God will redeem all things. The pain, the suffering, the brokenness of this world will someday be made new. And I think this is important for us at this moment in our world's history. Why is it important? Because I hear people asking me, so what's God doing with COVID? What's God want us to learn and know? What is it that we need to know so I can learn it and get over this? It may take a time. We may never know in this lifetime what God's up to. We may not see in our lifetime the redemption that God will bring out of this moment. That does not mean we don't follow. That does not mean that we're not faithful. That does not mean that redemption is not happening. It means that we're to be patient. Because God's timing is not ours. And we are called to be faithful in this moment. Even though we do not know how it will turn out. To be faithful. God will redeem this time. Just as God redeemed Joseph's 12 years. We may be lucky enough to see that redemption. We may not see it until eternity comes. We know redemption will happen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hey everyone, it's time for prayers of the congregation. We'll bring to the Lord some of the concerns that are on our hearts from this past week. Um, this week I've lifted a prayer from an author that I enjoy. But within this prayer, you will see some of the themes that are probably on our minds. Things like suffering in terms of COVID, loneliness, uh, the racism that we see in our present world, and our hope for the future. The prayer, just in case you are curious, is by a fellow named Ted Lauder, and it's from his book, Gorillas of Grace. Gorillas as in independent fighting units as opposed to the animal. Anyways, let's turn to our God in prayer. This is called Help Me to Believe in Beginnings. God of history and my heart, so much has happened to me during these whirlwind days. I have known death and birth. I have been brave and scared. I've hurt. I've helped. I've been honest. I've lied. I've destroyed. I've created. I've been with people. I've been lonely. I've been loyal and I've been betrayed. You know my frail heart and my frayed history. And now another day begins. Oh God, help me to believe in beginnings and in my beginning again, no matter how often I failed before. Help me to make beginnings, to begin going out of my weary mind into fresh dreams, daring to make my own bold tracks in the land of now to be forgiven that I may experience mercy, to begin questioning the unquestionable that I may know truth, to begin discipling that I may create beauty, to begin sacrificing that I may make peace, to begin loving that I may realize joy. Help me to be a beginning to others, to be a singer to the songless, a storyteller to the aimless, a befriender to the friendless, Become a be beginning of hope for the despairing, of assurance for the doubting, of reconcil reconciliation for the divided, of wholeness for the broken, 
of peace for the frightened and the violent of the earth. Help me to believe in beginnings, to make a beginning, to be a beginning, so that I may not just grow old, but grow new. Each day, this wild, amazing life, you call me to live with the passion of Jesus Christ. And these things we pray in the name of our Lord, who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So welcome to a few announcements, um, some of you have heard before, but probably worth repeating. So that on July the 6th, small groups, be they for study, a prayer, for fellowship, are free to gather here at St. Andrews. There will be two spaces downstairs in the fellowship hall that will be set up as circles with up to 10 chairs. And we've also heard from a number of people who would be interested in gathering in the prayer garden. And there also will, so you can bring your own chair if you wish to, a lawn chair and be out there in groups of up to 10. Um, we will have some markers at six foot intervals. So you just put your chair above one of those markers out there and go off to the races. Um, you do need to book ahead if you're gonna be using the space so that we don't end up with 25 groups of 10 all at the same time. That was a joke, you're supposed to laugh now. I got but, it. <laughs> So just so that we can manage the groups that are coming. Um, but, and again, this doesn't need to be study groups. Um, if you want to come, if you've got three or seven or six or seven, three or four, who would like to get together and just meet and talk, see each other, we know it's really important at this time. Um, so there's space here that you can do that. Um, just call Sam in the office and book that space. There will be a study taking place in the evenings on, sorry, on Monday, starting on July the 6th, um, looking at God's mercy, using a book called The God Impulse. And we're now up to five people in the group. And so there's more space for another five to join us. Um, and so we look forward to um, those who might want to come and join us in the conversation about God's mercy. Vacation Bible School will be taking place in the mornings, July 13 to 17, um, gathering together for about an hour and a half each day. Um, we have guidelines that will make sure that kids are as safe as possible and that we will control, control activities in a way that will limit any spread. Um, and so we invite you to sign up. Um, you do need to sign up for this program so we have a sense of how many children will be involved in the program. And I want to give a shout out right now to those who are working on our Facebook page. In particular, most of that load is being carried by Robin Shoemaker, and she is doing a magnificent job with the Facebook page. So if you're on Facebook, we encourage you to visit the St. Andrews Presbyterian Church Fergus. You need all of that. Um, there are way too many St. Pre Andrews Presbyterian Churches, so St. Andrews Presby Presbyterian Church Fergus, to um, the Facebook page. And while we're talking about virtual things, electronic things, if you have enjoyed watching our services online, we would encourage you to subscribe to St. Andrews's, face, St. Andrews's YouTube site, because once we get to 100 subscribers, we will have a channel dedicated to us and to our videos. So we just have about 24 people to go. So if you've enjoyed it, just subscribe. And it does mean that you'll get updates as um, new video feeds are loaded on, um, on our YouTube place. But So please join us in trying to enhance the um, online presence, the virtual presence that we have. Thank you for your support and encouragement. Have a great summer. We'll talk to you next week.
Now and forevermore. Amen.